We're moving on to James chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And this isn't a real exciting passage. It's not a really happy passage because it talks about the consequences of sin. And starting here in verse 14, it says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The outside world is a big problem. The outside world is continually bombarding our senses with all manner of lust and temptation. But the outside world really wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't have any allurement if it wasn't for our flesh and the passions of sin that still reside in our flesh. And so he says we're tempted when we are enticed by our own lust. And we know from Galatians chapter 5, reading the works of the flesh, we know exactly all of those lusts that are resident within our flesh and how much trouble they cause. Verse 15, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When does lust conceive? Lust, you all know what it's like to be in the woe, in the, in the throes rather of temptation. No, I won't. Yes, I will. No, I won't. At that moment when the scales tip and you say, I'm going to do it, that's when the lust has conceived and it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. There is nothing, absolutely nothing good about sin. There is nothing worthwhile about sin. It's just simply not worth it. Nothing good comes from sin. It always brings forth death, even in the life of the child of God. Do not be deceived, my who? My beloved brethren. So he's not saying, don't be deceived, all of you worldly unsaved people. He's saying, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Even in the born again child of God, sin still brings forth death when we partake of it. And so it's very important that we keep those things in mind. And hopefully by going through this, uh, this is not intended in any way to make us afraid of sin but it is intended to make us hate sin more. And it is intended to uh, cause us to be even more careful to stay as far away from sin as we possibly can. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, about the power of sin. And don't think because you are a child of God that if you give in to sin that it won't overtake and destroy your life. It will. Don't be deceived. So when he says there, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, in verse 16, he's talking about two different kinds of deception. Number one, being lured and enticed by the sin's bait. We're deceived that way into thinking that somehow this will satisfy me, somehow this will be pleasurable, somehow this will make me happy, and none of the above are true. It only brings death and problems. But then the second deception that he's talking about here is presuming that one can sin without consequences. Sometimes we think that if I confess my sin, then God is faithful and just and he forgives me my sin and he cleanses me from all unrighteousness, which is true. And we think that that will wipe away all of the consequences. How many of you have realized in your life that it doesn't? Uh, you do something stupid, and we reap stupid even when we're forgiven for that stupid. And we need to understand that when we sin, it sets a destructive chain reaction in motion in the spiritual realm. And when you realize that, you need to realize, I've got to stay as far away from this as possible. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, don't be deceived. It's interesting that he's using that same language again. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Even the born-again child of God, that's who he's writing to. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap from the flesh 
corruption. You've heard it said, the best way to crucify the flesh is to starve it, neglect it. Don't let it have its way. Don't give it anything that it wants. And as you do, it grows weaker and loses its power over you. But as soon as you feed it, it's like a monster and it excites its appetite and it gains more power over you. If you sow to your own flesh, you will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So just, you know, break down your day tomorrow into segments of this is one action, this is the next action, this is my conversation, my words, this moment, five minutes from now I'm going to be in a different conversation. All of those actions and words, what am I sowing? Am I sowing to the good or am I sowing to the evil? What will I reap as a result of this? Let us not lose hope in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. It's a deception when he says, don't be deceived. I put them in your notes. It's a deception to presume that indulging in sin won't have consequences because somehow God doesn't see, he doesn't know, he doesn't notice. Somehow God will overlook it. God's not mocked. He's not stupid. He saw what you did. He heard what you said. He read the thoughts of your heart. He knows. God's not mocked. You're not getting away with it. And then the other kind of deception is presuming that God's forgiveness takes away all of the consequences. And you can be forgiven and you have free and clear access back unto God and His relationship and His presence. But a lot of times those consequences remain and it's not worth it. All of us in this room are bearing scars from past wounds past sins, the stupid things that we did, and we carry that luggage through life, don't we, in many different ways. So let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Whether we sow to the good or whether we sow to sin, we don't always see the consequences right away. It takes time. And so that's why he's saying, don't lose heart in doing good because the time will come where you will begin to reap from what you've sown. But also when you sin, don't make the mistake of delayed consequences mean there will, there will be no consequences. Yeah, there will be. They haven't come yet, but the time will come, as he's saying here in verse 9. So let us not lose heart in doing good. If we continue to sow to the Spirit, to the things of God, we will reap accordingly. Why do we resist temptation to sin? Before we dive into this headlong, I just wanted to say, you know, we, we resist temptation to sin because we love God. We don't resist temptation because we want to avoid bad karma. You know, and I'm, I'm just quoting that. Uh, kind of sarcastically as the world. You hear about the world using the term bad karma, good karma all the time. And we don't resist temptation because we don't want to suffer ill consequences. That's not the primary purpose for resisting temptation. We resist temptation because sin grieves the heart of God. Sin is an offense to the holiness of God. Sin separates us from God. That's why we resist temptation. We resist temptation because of our love for God. But some extra incentive never hurts, right? And so the extra incentive tonight is sin always brings consequences. So let's not give in to sin in any way. First, we need to remember this. No sin is secret from God. I don't know why, you know, we don't get this at times. <laughs> but we, we sin in secret thinking that we're really alone and that nobody can see us. When the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now, if you really believe that, if I really believed that, and maybe I should say it this way, if we were as aware of that as we should be, then we wouldn't do those stupid things in secret. 
because we would know I've got a pair of eyes on me and they are the Lord God's. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 says, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person for God will bring every act to judgment. He will bring everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. His eyes are in every place watching the evil and the good. Boy, if we could really be aware of that if we could really be conscious of his presence at all times. Jesus in Luke 12 talks about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And, you know, a hypocrite is an expert at being secretive, right? Boy, he can hide his sins and hide his pride and hide his heart really well by projecting a false image. And so he's saying, beware of hypocrisy, beware of those people that have secret lives, secret motives, a secret heart. They project an image that they are not because there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed. And everything hidden will become known. And whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the inner rooms, convinced that nobody was listening, will be proclaimed upon the housetops. No sin is secret from God. And boy, it would sure help us if that became more and more of a reality in our hearts. The immediate and most dangerous consequence of our sin is the strength that gives to our flesh. Like we were just saying, best way to crucify your flesh is to starve it, neglect it, don't give it anything it wants. Let it grow weaker and weaker and weaker and dominate over the thing. But as soon as you start to give in to the flesh, you feed it and it awakes and it gets stronger and it starts to control more and more. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. And remember, Paul is not reverting to legalism. He's not reverting to self-will and self-discipline. He knew better than any of us that it's only by the grace of God that our flesh is mortified and controlled. But what he is saying here is, I make sure that my body stays under the discipline of the Holy Spirit. I discipline my body. I make it my slave. I make sure that I don't give in to it. This is our goal. We're not always real successful at it, are we? But this has got to be the standard that we live by and long for. I discipline my body. I make it my slave. Don't feed that monster. It will overtake you. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And if you wanted to go for another two hours, we could bring up Calvinism, but we won't. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. And so the focus here is not upon the wicked. The focus here is the fact that sin has cords that bind us and enslave us. We call it addiction in our days. But you can be addicted to any kind of sin and be ensnared so fast if you keep feeding it and giving it power that you can't break yourself free. Remember here in Judges chapter 16, the story of Samson? And Delilah says to Samson, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. You remember the story. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death and he told her all that was in his heart. And they cut his hair, and his strength left him. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, 
brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground at the mill in the prison. And you think, Samson, what are you doing? You resisted it three times. Couldn't you do it number four? You know what the answer is? He couldn't do it number four. He had fed that monster three times until it overpowered him. And he, could, he knew it was right. And this is, this is the insanity of sin. He knew what was right. He knew what was wrong. He knew what would happen if they cut his hair. And he had to taste of that sin just one more time anyway. That's the insanity of sin. Sin makes you insane. But what happened, the immediate and the most dangerous consequence of our sin is the strength that it gives our flesh, and you keep feeding it one time, two times, three times, and with Samson, the fourth time was the charm, the charm and he could no longer control it. He could no longer recover from it. You keep feeding it, it will overpower you. Sin brings consequences even when consequences are delayed. This is an interesting story here in David with uh, Bathsheba, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 5. The woman Bathsheba conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. It, this is, you know, this is uh, really very disappointing in David but it's kind of remarkable to see. Immediately he sends for Joab. I mean, he, immediately his mind starts to weave this strategy. How can I get out of this? I know. Send Joab home. I think David understood how the reproductive system operated. Why didn't he think beforehand? There could be a consequence from this. See, that's, again, sin makes you insane where you ignore the consequences. And then, further down in the chapter, verse 26, you, you know the whole thing that he went through with Uriah, and Uriah had too much integrity to fall into the trap that David was setting for him. And so, finally, David tells the army to withdraw at just the wrong time in battle. Uriah, Uriah gets killed in battle. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, the whole point in this uh, part of the story is this. It takes nine months from conception to birth, right? Most historians and commentators say that, uh, you know, that by now at least a year had passed. If you think from the time that he first stole Uriah's wife, to this point in the story, you know, it's, it's 9 to 12 months. If you committed a sin, and 9 or 12 months later, nothing bad has happened, and you think you covered it up, and you think you got away with it, and you think, wow, I dodged that one. It's over. Nothing will happen now, right? Nobody will know now. But then remember, Nathan the prophet comes to David, and he rebukes David. David confesses and says, I've sinned against the Lord. Boy, that must have been, you know, in those moments, you are, you are just so sick of what you've done and disgusted and loathing yourself, but you are so glad to finally get it off your chest. You know, David here is so glad that he can just finally come to the light. I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord. That's a whole other topic. 
when you sin. You scorn the Lord. The child who is born to you shall what? Shall die. And so here, nine to 12 months later, David's probably thinking, got through this one. I got to pass somehow. This one won't catch up with me. Did it? Just because consequences are delayed does not mean they're not coming. God is not mocked. You can read there in 2 Samuel 12, there's a bunch of other consequences as well that David suffered, not just the death of his son. I want you to see this as well. Sin brings consequences even when we are truly repentant. In the same story with David, when Nathan rebukes David and David says, I've sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has also taken away your sin. You shall not die. Now, knowing the Lord the way that we do, you know, for David to say, I have not sinned against the Lord, doesn't sound like that uh, worthy of a repentance, right? But I've sinned against the Lord is all the repentance, is all the words you need to say when your heart is truly broken. And the Lord would not have forgiven him if he didn't come with a truly broken and contrite heart. So, you know, whatever transpired here, we're not seeing the full picture in print. But when David said, I have sinned against the Lord, his heart must have truly been breaking. And the Lord forgave him and the Lord took away his sin. And that's really all you need if your heart's truly broken and sorry. Remember from here, Psalms 51 is written about David's repentance in this whole affair. And it's a psalm, it's a prayer of repentance that's been the bar, the standard for repentance for all of these years and generations. But yet even that doesn't take away the consequences, does it? Verse 14, however, because by this deed you've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. David, I accept your repentance. I know you're broken and sorry over what you done, have done. However, the child will still die. We're forgiven. Our account with the Lord is wiped clean. That sin is removed from us as far as the east is from the west. We can come boldly into the presence of God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, yet the consequences at times still remain. This should cause you to hate sin. And this should be that extra incentive of, I'm going to stay as far away from this as possible. And so the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. The interesting thing about this, again, this is right around a year after Uriah died. Now, don't you think a year after Uriah died, God would have called her your wife? But what did God call her? Uriah's widow. It really ticked God off that David would have the nerve to steal another man's wife. And he's just letting David know this thing wasn't done right, David. Next, God is sovereign over the severity and the duration of the consequences. Only God can control the consequences and balance the scales of justice. Now, when consequences come, consequences, it, it, it's not that you're being punished to pay back what you've done wrong. That's, that's not it. Because Jesus paid back what you did wrong. And so you've got to separate the two in your mind. As far as God is concerned, I am forgiven 
My account is clean before the Lord because of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that paid the price for my sins for all of eternity, for my eternal salvation. Yet, we still live in a world dominated by sin. And you set in motion those gears of sin that now will grind out the destruction of what you started. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16. When David heard, your child will die, he went before the Lord and he inquired of God for the child and he fasted and he went and lay all night on the ground and the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat with them. He was just completely beside himself. And then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. And they said, man, if he finds out the child's died, he'll hurt himself. But in verse 19, David picks up on this, and he sees them whispering, and he says, is the child dead? He kind of picked up on what was happening. And they said, yes, the child has died. And so verse 20, David arose from the ground. He washed. He anointed himself. He changed his clothes. He came into the house of the Lord, and he did what? He worshiped. When you sin, and God graciously forgives you of your sin and wipes your account clean, yet in his sovereignty and in his wisdom, there are consequences that remain. This is how you receive those consequences. You don't grumble, you don't complain, you don't say, well, God, I repented, what's the problem? Why can't you take this away? Gee, maybe next time I won't repent and act like a little juvenile over it. You did the deed, you need to bear the circumstances, the consequences. And he didn't go in before the house of the Lord and complain to God he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped and said, God, you are just, you are right. And so many times he uses those consequences in our life to break us, to cleanse us, to work that holy zeal and anger in us that says, I will never go back to that slop again. But when you bear this, the consequences of your sin, realize even those consequences are there by the sovereignty of God. So therefore, it's his wisdom that this is in my life. So, Father, I worship you knowing that you are just and fair in all that you do. And somehow this is right for me to bear these consequences. Worship him in that way. I like this in Lamentations chapter 3, <clears throat> starting at verse 1. I am the Lord who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. Lamentations chapter 3 is a chapter of someone being chastened by God's discipline. And so he's saying, I've seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. God is chastening me for my sin. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his head again and again, his hand again and again the whole day long. His hand is against me all day long. And then he goes on in the, the next half a dozen verses, I think, even describe this chastening even more where the guy just is devastated. But then look at verse 21. He talks about the devastation of the Lord's chastisement, but then in verse 21 he says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And though this chastening, though these consequences really hurt and they wound so deeply, I know the Lord still loves me. I know he'll never reject me or forsake me. I know he's only doing this because in his wisdom, he knows that, that it's right and that it's good. And more than all of that, 
I know he won't kill me. His steadfast love never ceases. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy will come one of these mornings. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So I will bear the circumstances of what I've done until the Lord sees fit to remove them, to lift them from my life. I want you to see this as well. Sin brings consequences even when we've been serving the Lord faithfully. This is a passage that Terry and I have talked about many different times. Here's Moses. You know the grief that the children of Israel gave him repeatedly time and time again, right? And so here they are complaining again. And instead of speaking to the rock, what does Moses do? He gets angry and he strikes the rock. He says, here now, you rebels. <laughs> right there, you know, oh, no. Moses, this isn't going to go well. And in anger, he strikes the rock. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Moses, you need to remember, you, you can bring water out of nothing. This is a miracle from God. God's the one doing this. But see, Moses, he's ticked off at the people. Now, knowing all that Moses went through with these people, don't you think God could have given him one pass? I mean, just, just one pass. God, just look the other way. Let me beat these heads a little bit here. Don't you think Mo Moses deserved one shot at him? What did God say? Because you did not believe me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now all in all, you know, when all is said and done, who was one of the guys on the Mount of Transfiguration? transfigured before the disciples. So Moses made out okay, right, in the end. But I just want you to see, even when you've been serving God faithfully and you think, God, surely I deserve one pass, right? There's times where even in those situations you bear the consequence of what you did. But God, I only did it once. I did it these other hundred times right, and I just did it one, wrong once. The justice of God. Those are calls that He makes, not us. And sometimes, even when we sin, we don't get that pass. Even though we've been faithfully serving and have put up with so much, we don't get that pass. We, there's still consequences. Again, this is not to make us afraid of sin. It's to make us to hate sin even more. And then last, sin brings the loss of heavenly rewards. You know 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You can read it tonight or tomorrow if you want. But every work we do will be judged by the fire of God. Father, we thank you for the warnings that your word of God gives to us. And we ask that they would work in us a sobriety a healthy fear, not an unholy fear that brings torment, but Father, we pray that it would produce in us a healthy fear that says, I want nothing to do with this. Father, teach us that even for the believer, even for the child of God, when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Nothing good ever comes from sin. So why even entertain it? Give us that zeal, that carefulness, that vengeance. And Father, let us pursue holiness with all of our heart. Keep us safe as we go tonight. Keep our family safe. Please keep us safe from the evil one, from violence, from injury, from harm. Deliver us from temptation, we ask, and bring us back Sunday to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.